my name is Dory Hornsby. I'm the product manager here, one of the product managers here at Liberty AV, and this is a uh, this is a product line that uh, we have a lot of interest in. And, and surprisingly, uh, when I started this project, I was really kind of shocked at the the adoption of this. Um, there's there's definitely a, a lot of interest in in using this product type, and there's definitely a lot of clear advantages for it. So. Uh, some of this may be remedial for some, but uh, we'll definitely review uh, basically our hardware uh, offerings. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, configuration and, and how the system uh, is set up and uh, talk about things like our iOS app and things like that. So we'll, we'll, we'll cover a lot of content here. But uh, for those that don't know, uh, you know, audio and visual over IP, AV over IP or video over IP uh, is just basically uh, a way to route these high definition video audio control signals to, you know, various displays using just a standard Ethernet network. Uh, like I said, the adoption is rapidly increases, increasing, and uh, we really use standard video codecs, which are really not new, and I think it's really uh, Important to note that you know what we're offering are things that are are, are well vetted in the industry um, as far as video codecs and so forth. Uh, nothing here is, is is radically new, but we're using really solid technologies that's been you know that's that's lasted for years. Um, so uh, that's definitely one of the things that I like about this product line is we're we're using you know switches and uh, IP switches and. That is such a solid technology, and the whole world really runs off IP switches. So, I think it's a, a, a great advantage for us to use our our AV switching backbone on on such a reliable technology. So, uh, basically, yes, the advantages are you know scalability, flexibility. You're not confined to just standard AV port limitations, and that's a that's a big uh, attraction for this product type. And of course, uh, system architecture will allow for longer cabling runs because we're using IP and data packets. Uh, we can use standard Cat5e cable, and we can, you know, run one endpoint 100 meters to a switch. So uh, it gives us, uh, it, it, it definitely allows us a little more flexibility on the on the cabling runs, and definitely where the cost savings are. are are really Harvard is going to be in the larger matrices systems like a, when you have to be forced out of 16 or 32 or even 64 inputs or outputs um, that becomes very costly if you have a 2 by 17 system well you, you're forced into a 32 by 32 so that definitely um, you know it, it definitely creates a, a cost savings here when you have to be flexible and all of our systems basically are going to be a la carte so if you have a 2 by 17 system well you can simply buy the, the two transmitters and the 17 uh, receivers and uh, that's all you need so that is a, a big attraction for this type of system and of course AV distribution today you all know you know fixed IO right and they're we're very, very reliant on proprietary matrix switchers these days and they're difficult to scale difficult to change um, they can be difficult to integrate so we're all familiar with these types of switches so this type of technology is refreshing uh, so you know let's talk about a little bit of our uh, a little bit about our hardware architecture here so um, simple traditional AV system here, uh, as you would see, you know, inputs and outputs, um, you know, very, very simple. We all are very familiar with this type of, you know, AV system. Um, and of course, our hardware architecture is going to look a little something like this. We have AV sources plugging into encoders. Uh, you can call them transmitters as well if you'd like to use that nomenclature. Um, everything's plugged into the IP switch and then of course decoders uh, are plugged into the displays uh, so this is this is how a, a lot of architecture exists out there already with other manufacturers so this is what this is what our architecture uh, definitely looks like uh, what we do is we add on a control interface uh, that basically is the brains of the system so if you have a uh, 
do you have a 2x2 two two or 4x20 or whatever your system is, you will require one of our control interfaces to, uh, to basically house all the settings in. Uh, and of course, the control interface is something that will allow third-party control. You're able to, um, you know, uh, use our, the LAN or the 232 uh, port on the control interface to control the entire system, and you'll see that soon. So this is basically our our hardware architecture uh, and you know what it looks like. So um, very very simple. Um, let's talk a little bit about you know the switches. Uh, we're suggesting so you know like I said we're using you know standard video codecs to compress the data into smaller bit streams so uh, and this is utilizing multicast so level 3 IP switches are required or what they call level 2 plus which is basically level 2 switches that have all of these multicasting options and, and management options so uh, all of these systems are designed to run over a gigabit PoE managed switch so that's what we're going to suggest uh, for these systems. Of course, uh, I explained uh, encoders used for uh, basically transmitters and decoders, basically receivers uh, in HD base T or extender nomenclature. So, you know, what can you do with a video over IP system? Well, like I said, you know, highly efficient, scalable matrices. You can do a 5x7, a 2x13, 37x2, and and yes, there is a 99 by 299 system out there. The boards that we're using are very well vetted and, and um, you know, they definitely are, you know, are, are out there in the industry and, uh, and have worked very well. Uh, so uh, applications, you know, we can say digital signage, entertainment, corporate AV, but I think you guys are more inter interested in the residential application side of things. Um, so I, we're going to focus probably more on the, the 4K solution here today, but just to let you know, we do have two series in this IP Links offering, uh, the 2000 series and the 5000 series. The 2000 series is our 1080p solution, so the maximum resolution is 1080p. It uses the H.264 uh, video codec, which has been around since the 90s. Uh, the 5000 series, the maximum resolution on this is 4K60 uh, at 420 uh, color compression. Uh, we use JPEG 2000 for the video codec for this. Uh, so these are the two primary solutions that we're offering. Like I said, we'll focus a little more on the 5000 series so you understand that. So um, just real quick on the 1080p solution, very, very simple solution. Uh, the encoder, uh, of course, has HDMI input, a decoder, HDMI output. Um, it supports uh, audio, uh, two-channel audio, and has an audio output uh, via Phoenix on the encoder and the decoder, so you can strip away the audio either at the head end or at the display. And of course, it, it supports 232 as well. And then here's a little closer look at the control interface, which works for both series. Um, you just need one interface for the entire system. Uh, API allows integration into third-party control systems. And of course, using the control box, you're able to auto-discover and easily set up uh, the entire system using our PC configuration tool called IP Links Configurator. Um, when you use this uh, control box as well, you also uh, have access to the free iOS app, IP Links. It's in the App Store, uh, which is basically a full motion preview and control app. So let's just move right into the 5000 series because I believe this is what we're probably more interested in. Uh, it is our 4K solution. So as I mentioned before, it does use the JPEG 2000 video codec. Um, it does support resolutions up to 4K60, 420, and uh, HDMI connectivity for source and sync. It does support CEC. Uh, there's an HDMI loop output on the encoder, uh, and that would be great for uh, stripping audio off of the embedded uh, HDMI stream because it does support PCM 8 channel. Uh, of course, since this is a 4K product, it is, it is HDCP 2.2 compliant. 
this will support video walls as well, and we'll talk a little, little more about that. I'll show you, uh, what, you know, a, a, a tool in this uh, series that is uh, for bezel compensation. So it allows you to set up a video wall up to 16 by 16, and then of course. Uh, dial in all of the specifics for the display so you have one even smooth uh, image across several displays. Uh, of course, very low latency and uh, this supports PoE. Uh, so if you use a gigabit uh, PoE managed switch and you manage your, your PoE budget correctly, you're going to be able to power up all the encoders and decoders control box if you choose to do so. Um, that keeps the power supplies from behind the televisions and bulky power supplies at the head end. Um, so it does support 232, has passed through ports as well, does support our, uh, IR. So IR in and out on the encoder and decoder side so you can go uh, either way using IR. Of course, we talked about uh, audio if you want to strip off audio off the HDMI, but it does have a de-embedding port uh, for audio on either side. So you can uh, strip two-channel audio off the encoder uh, or the decoder if you choose to do so. Uh, once again, it does support multi-channel audio formats up to eight-channel PCM. And of course, there is USB extension ports. Uh, so this can be really a, a kind of a KVM extender if you choose to do so, use it that way. Uh, so the IR, the USB, the 232, and even the audio can all be routed independently of the video. So it's a very, very nice feature. And, uh, and also a very flexible feature as well is each decoder, you know, like a receiver, is equipped with a scaler. Uh, so, you know, there's probably going to be many situations where, yes, uh, in a residential situation, you, you may be using uh, 4K throughout, uh, you know, the, the home uh, in, in certain areas, but there may be 1080p displays, and you want to display that, you know, you want to display content on those. Well, uh, you're able to dial in those resolutions um, on the configuration software. So very flexible, you're able to mix and match resolutions and you don't have to get stuck with um, lowest common denominator uh, when it comes to switching. So very, very flexible. Uh, and of course, once again, the control interface, uh, this is you know the, the brains of the system and allows third party control. So one is required for each system. All right, so here's just a little closer look at the encoder which will, will live at the head end. Of course, you have your HDMI input and your HDMI out, IR in and out, your 232 through port, your USB host port is here, and of course you have analog in and out using 3.5 millimeter uh, uh, connection ports here. All right, and if we look at the decoder, we'll see that the the decoder, of course, has a long HDMI out, uh, but also you see the IR ports, 232, and the audio out port. The, the USB uh, client side, this is basically the USB client side, uh, will have two uh, small A ports right on the front. And just, to, just keep in mind is that uh, this is really for HID devices. Um, and not for things like, you know, USB 2.0 or 3.0 cameras, so it doesn't support that. One thing to note is that if you wanted to do a distribution scheme using this particular product, you don't have to have the control interface. You can simply do a 1 to 10 or 1 to 50 system uh, if that comes up. Um, that's not going to come up very often in a residential setting, but I just wanted to throw that out there as well. You can also use this as pretty much a standalone extender if you wanted to. If you wanted to just use uh, this as a one-to-one, -one, um, you can certainly do that. So very flexible. You can use it in a matrices, uh, you know, setup, um, uh, or you can use it in a DA setup, or you can use it as a point-to-point a -point system. So very, very flexible. Uh, this is Bill Zydek. We have a question, uh, a couple questions actually that came through. It might be a good time to answer them. Uh, so is the 5000 actually outputting uh, 4096 by 2160? 
Uh, no, it, it, okay, so it is outputting uh, what, what we call UHD, which is more of the CINTI resolution, not the, the full 4K, um, the DCI standard, basically, is what you're asking about. So it, it, it's more UHD uh, CINTI uh, 4K than anything. And what is the resolution on that, just so everybody, in case uh, everybody doesn't know? 3840 by 2160. That's the UHD, that's the CINTI standard. The Cinema 4K is what you're really referring to, which is the DCI standard. So that's 4096 by 2160. This will just support up to UHD, basically. Uh, another question is, um, will the, the embedding of the uh, audio output on the uh, encoder allow for Dolby Digital downmix while still transmitting uh, full multi-channel through the other decoders? So uh, a couple things. Number one, uh, to go back to the first question on the resolution. So it's 3840 by 2160 at 30 hertz. Okay. Uh, so the output, it, we will accept a you know 3840 by 2160 at 60 hertz, 420 color space. But the output is 3840 2160 at 30 hertz. Uh, on the um, question about audio, the the product is not have an onboard Dolby licensed DSP, so it will not de-embed or downmix. It will de-embed, but it will not downmix uh, audio. Uh, if you need uh, to downmix, then you need to set up the Blu-ray player or source to do that. But then obviously, then you're sending out uh, multi-channel PCM across everything. So you have to set the right balance between you know, what you want to do given the fact that it does not do a downmix. There's another question that came through. Uh, is there a minimum distance there must be run? Uh, some of the Kramer and binary products have minimum distance requirements. No, there is not. Uh, will there be latency between the source and video transmission? So let's talk about latency for a second. So latency has to do with the amount of compression that is applied to the signal. Um, the, this particular product has at most one and a half frames of latency from encoder to decoder um, the, the, because it, it, the compression is much lower on this product. The 2000 product, the 1080p solution, has a higher compression um, ratio. So the latency on that, depending upon how you have it set up, because you can um, play trade-offs between the amount of compression for video quality versus latency. And there, at a minimum, you're at about 80 milliseconds, and a maximum, you're at 240 milliseconds. Okay. All right. That's uh, all the questions right now. Okay. So here is a uh, very uh, simple connectivity, uh, kind of a one-line diagram here uh, that shows a lot of the, the I.O. here being taken advantage of. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to also share any of the information uh, I have here, PowerPoints or anything like that you want to share with your customers and so forth. Uh, I'm happy to, to give you what content I have. Here's a little closer look at a, uh, another one line that uh, really shows you what's possible with our 4K solution. Yes, it does support video walls as well as all the individual displays and so forth, KVM, audio, and so forth. So this is a, uh, this is a, would be kind of a commercial application, right? So let's talk just real quick about the system configuration. I won't uh, spend a lot of time on this, but I do like to let everyone know how easy it is to configure the systems, because with because with AV over IP, there's definitely, uh, you know, some products out there can be very laborious as far as system setup and system configuration and testing and so forth. So I do want to talk a little bit about that and show you uh, how this is done uh, so uh, you know what to do. So really three steps here in system configuration. You do have to set up your IP switch. And what we've done is we've provided a configuration guide, and it's online, uh, that you can access, uh, and it addresses all the major IP switches such as Dell, Cisco, Luxel, the VAO, which is the brand that we distribute, uh, Package, et cetera. 
Um, so the interface, the control interface uh, on our web page, it's the IPEXCB part number. Uh, if you go to that uh, web page, you'll be able to find the networking and configuration guide. Once again, I'm happy to send all this out after uh, our webinar is over with. Um, but uh, it's a very, very simple guide that really walks you through if you're doing, you know, a single switch setup, it gives you settings for a single switch setup. If you're doing um, multiple hubs off of a core switch, well, it'll give you those settings as well. Uh, very easy to configure. Uh, usually takes about less than five minutes for to configure your switch. So we've vetted all of these switches out for you, and in our networking guide, it tells you what we suggest, and of course gives you all of those settings. Step two is really connecting all the hardware to the IP switch, um, and of course step three is using the IP links configurator to set up all the endpoints, assign aliases to those endpoints. Uh, you can then establish your matrices or your outputs, uh, single output matrices, or using video walls. And then, of course, assigning all those endpoints to those outputs. So that's really the three steps for configuration. You set up your IP switch, connect all the hardware to the IP switch, and then you use the IP links configurator. The configurator is also online on our control interface uh, uh, web page, product page. Uh, it will have this configuration software on there free, so you just download it as a zip file. All right. So uh, talking a little bit more about what we suggest for an Ethernet switch, uh, it's definitely, you know, layer three. Any layer three switch is going to be appropriate for this. Uh, even if you are using a layer three switch, a brand that we don't have a configuration guide for, you can simply look through the networking guide and you can you can start to see what uh, configuration settings are needed. Uh, so it's easy to translate uh, those uh, settings from, from the switches that we have to what you want to use. Um, of course, the ones that we have in our networking guide is what we've tested and we've verified, so we know they work. So it does need to support multicast forwarding or filtering, IGMP snooping querier, uh, fast leave, it needs to support jumbo frames of 8,000 bytes or larger. And then of course, if you are using multiple hubs, it does need to support dynamic multicast router port and forwarding unknown multicast to multicast router port only. So all of this information, once again, in our networking guide that is online. So just a real quick peek at the, at the configurator, because basically the way this works is that uh, you plug your computer into the network switch where all of the network devices and endpoints are plugged into, and it auto searches and it finds everything instantly. Within about 30 seconds, you can see all the decoders and the encoders show up on the system. The control interface actually shows up on the encoder side. Uh, so you can find everything very, very easily. You set up one VLAN ID for this entire system, uh, so, yeah, switch configuration, very easy. And then, of course, now all that you would need to do is, is start naming the, the decoders and the encoders and start assigning all of the output or all the devices to these outputs that you create in the groups section, right? So, very easy software to manipulate. Um, I also do uh, webinars for setup and configuration as well, so if you want to uh, get uh, more of the technical guys and engineering types, uh, techs and so forth, uh, on a webinar with me to just do configuration training, that's available as well. I just wanted to show you this software and just show you how easy it is to use. You're building your outputs very easily, you're naming all your decoders, and it's just dragging and dropping everything into place. Uh, very, very easy software to use. And of course, once you're, uh, you know, once you're done with all of your settings, you just upload everything to the control interface and it lives there on the interface. Uh, if you need to download settings and you don't have that profile saved on a computer like you're doing a, a service call or what have you, you can simply download all those settings that live on the, uh, the control interface so you can always access it uh, at a job site. Uh, real quick, just talking about the video wall support bezel compensation tool, which is really 5,000 series only. 
this is a very, very simple tool in case you're doing video walls out there. Um, you know, you basically punch in all the, the, the specifications of your, your display, uh, width, height of the display, as well as the screen width, height. And that way you're, you're going to come away with a very smooth image across all of the displays. Dory, can I add something? Sure thing. Go ahead. Um, so I just want to point out, because it wasn't mentioned earlier, the 2000 series does also support video wall. You just do not have the bezel compensation. Yep, good point. You can definitely do video walls with the 2000 series. Um, you know, just personally, I think the 5000 is, is probably better suited just because you have this tool and it's uh, just good peace of mind knowing that you can create that, that very smooth transition from display to display using this type of tool. I agree. Talking about our, our, our iOS and our app and control preview, Basically, once you know your your system is configured and uploaded into the control interface, the iOS app uh, that is free online in the App Store just by searching IP Links, um, you'll be able to uh, do very simple uh, source selection uh, via drag and drop, and you can also power on the displays uh, or power off the displays using CEC. So very simple. This is really not designed to be, uh, you know, a control system or anything for the system. We just wanted to provide something that is going to give you very simple source selection. Uh, and uh, the way this screen is laid out is all the sources uh, can be seen down here at the bottom. And then all the displays, all your matrices outputs are here uh, at the top. Uh, so you will actually be seeing uh, live previews of the sources, uh, and they come in at like five frames per second, so, uh, so it's not going to be very taxing on the app. But you'll actually be able to see the sources. You can name them as well, whatever you want, but um, being able to see these sources and then just simply drag and drop them to the destination is very easy. And that's pretty much the app. Uh, even if you decide to build, you know, you know, sophisticated, uh, you know, matrices and video walls, uh, it's going to be able to show you all of this. Uh, so you're going to be able to drag and drop uh, everything, even onto video walls uh, and so forth. Uh, once again, you can display, you can turn the displays on and off with the software. You can even save some presets here on the the app itself if you like this. If you like this input and output configuration that you have here and you want to save it as one of the presets, well, you just simply hit save and, and then you can decide what preset it'll save into. So uh, very, very simple uh, app interface. It is iPad only, uh, uh, iOS only. We don't have an Android version of this. It is to note that we do have a version of this that you can use on a Windows computer. So we do have that available as well. So we're coming to the end of our, uh, our PowerPoint here. So just to review, you know, uh, what can you do with our systems? Well, once again, you can create flexible, scalable matrices using either the 1080p or the 4K solution. Uh, I think it's definitely to note that with the 4K solution, with the scaling options on each decoder, it's a very, very flexible system to create uh, for a la carte systems. Um, you know, it does support video walls. Both systems supports video walls up to 16 by 16. Um, you know, it is to note that, you know, we do distribute Naveo switches. And it is possible that if you wanted uh, us to help you pre-configure switches uh, for orders, we definitely do that. Um, you know, it does take, you know, two or three days just to... Uh, to get to it, but however, we will help with uh, switches and the pre-configuration of those switches. So that is a, a value add. Uh, so you can just receive a switch that's already set up and you can just, you know, plug everything up and start configuring. Once again, the iOS app is really a non-control system, but it's great for just control and preview, uh, you know, sources and so forth. Uh, and of course, you know, there's many ways you can use this system residential digital side is commercial and so forth so lots of uh, lots of applications that it would apply in 
So uh, any more questions out there? Uh, there were some more questions here. So first of all, will the latency for the audio output uh, of, for instance, a Blu-ray player that has been downmixed externally from the optical output of the Blu-ray be noticeable as a video as video continues through the embedding and de-embedding process? So uh, I think what he's asking is, and this is really going to depend much on the um, uh, output of the Blu-ray player and if there is uh, any kind of latency at the source. Uh, I can tell you that uh, this is from uh, Ziggy. Uh, I can tell you, Ziggy, that there's, uh, there may be other ways to handle that if you do encounter latency where uh, there's devices that can uh, strip the audio off of the HDMI in real time as the video. So uh, that might be a better solution in case you run into that issue. Correct me if I'm wrong, but 4K at 30 hertz would make the image judder on the screen. Uh, actually, 4K 30 is really uh, what most of the 4K material uh, is out is uh, out there recorded at. So, now 30 uh, uh, 30 frames per second is uh, pretty standard for 4K at this point. 4K 60 is uh, there's a lot less content available for that. Yeah, that's true. I'm really really struggling to find actual content that's uh, that that really supports you know 60 frames per second and uh, you know a high color uh, bit depth. So uh, I, most of everything that I see is, is is 4K 30. Here's another question. LG just released an 8K TV, so it looks like the world should catch up. So yes, uh, yeah, we're not even doing full res 4K, and uh, uh, companies are out promoting other things. So uh, exactly. I, I just want to also remind everybody that uh, we do have a demo kit available. So if uh, you're thinking about this for a larger project and uh, you would need us to um, uh, do some uh, demonstrations for you to show you how the product uh, uh, works in the field, uh, we're happy to do that. So any one of your tandem or all net reps can uh, get together with you and do those demonstrations. Uh, same thing goes for system design. And, you know, obviously this is going to be a new product for most of you, and uh, we don't expect you to kind of know all the details from a half hour webinar. So we're uh, more than willing to uh, get in the trenches with you and make sure that you have a uh, high degree of confidence that this is going to uh, work perfect for your project before uh, specifying. And I'll uh, back that up as well on our, on our end as well, the manufacturing end of it. Uh, we have resources available uh, for pre-sales design assistance, uh, system verification for much larger projects. Um, and then also we, uh, for, you know, definitely some, for some select projects, uh, we will be able to offer on-site uh, system configuration, uh, management, and so forth. So we do have some resources in place at the manufacturer level uh, that will assist in uh, the larger installs, uh, pre-sales and post-sales. So I just wanted to throw that out there as well. Great. There was a question on the ETA of control system driver profiles for Control 4, Savant, and obviously uh, uh, the other plethora of control systems that exist. Uh, that's a good question. Okay. So, um, yes, we have um, control drivers that are in the works right now. Uh, it's our desire to support several uh, control systems. So I'll give you the uh, immediate ETA on, on what's coming up right now. In about two weeks, uh, we're going to release the 5000 series Control 4 driver. Uh, so we have some customers and we have some projects that's happening uh, very quickly that's requested those. So we've got those coming in uh, right about two weeks, I'd say right before Thanksgiving. We'll probably release those. And uh, the where we will put those online is we will put those on the control interface uh, product page. So the IPEXCB part number online where the networking guide and IP leaks configurator exists, uh, that's where we're going to put our control drivers so you can download them. So uh, control, drive, uh, control 4 will be first in a couple of weeks. And then in December, about mid-December, we'll have the Crestron um, uh, control driver for that. And then I believe in January, we're going to see RTI uh, for this as well. And this would be all 5,000 series. Um, so, and as the months go, we'll be doing, um, 
you know, we'll definitely be doing Savant and uh, Elon and, and things like that. So we are going to support that, but that's what's coming up immediately, basically. If, uh, if you have any immediate opportunities that would be using a different control system, uh, please let us know, and uh, maybe we can help prioritize some of those things as well. So just, uh, just keep us in the loop of those upcoming jobs. It doesn't look like any other questions are coming through. So again, like I said, we'll kind of hang out here, and if anything comes up, feel free to ask. Um, but just wanted to thank you all again for uh, attending. Again, don't be shy about asking for demos. We're happy to bring the kits out. And uh, please make sure that uh, you get this information to the rest of the people in your organization to make sure that they can uh, catch the recording of this on the YouTube channel. Uh, and just a reminder, while you're at the YouTube channel, please uh, please subscribe. We're, uh, we're adding new content weekly. Thank you.